Okay, we've got a fair few things to get through today. So I suggest what we do is we kick off uh, anybody joining uh, later. We'll just have to miss the sort of admin parts, but I'm, I'm sure that's not a problem. Just to let everybody know, uh, we are recording this session. So if anybody has a, a, an issue with that, um, please shout now. Uh, the reason for recording it is that we do want to make sure that as many people get to see this as possible. So we will be publishing um, this presentation and, and the recording of it uh, on social media uh, and so on. Um, bear that in mind if and when you have any questions, um, if there are any questions you, you don't particularly want to ask in, in a more sort of general uh, forum, please keep those back and, and we'll deal with those uh, separately. So welcome to this session on uh, Electrolink's plans for providing a CSS adapter. Uh, I'm Paul Gath, I'm the uh, Chief Technical Officer and Director of Operations at Electrolink uh, and I'll be hosting today's call. Uh, sharing the presentation with me will be Alan Gregory. Uh, Electrolink's enterprise architect for the CSS adapter work and, and Alan will uh, introduce himself when he starts to take over uh, the presentation later on. So the session will include um, 15 slides. Um, we have sent these out by email to you um, in PDF format so um, please feel free to follow along. We are sharing them on the Skype call for anybody who is on the Skype call so you should be able to see uh, the first cover slide now. We did run the same session on Tuesday <clears throat> uh, and a number of attendees couldn't connect to Skype or couldn't see the slides for the whole duration. Uh, so you might still want to follow along on the sort of PDF version anyway, uh, if that makes it clearer to see. So if anyone who's on the call at the moment doesn't have a copy of those slides or can't see the screen, can they say so now and we will get those out to you? Um, Joanne from Nothing Grid Smart, if, you, if I could have a copy, that would be great. And you're, can you just let us know what your email address is, Joanne? Yeah, it's joanne.payne, P-A-Y-N-E, at nationalgrid.com. Lovely, thank you. So, Kyle, we'll get those out to you now. Is there anybody else who doesn't have a copy of the slides? No? Okay, I'll take that as... A, as um, Go to proceed then. So uh, apart from specific clarifications on the slides, I would, which you can ask during the presentation, can I ask that you keep sort of more detailed questions to the end? Will it be a session of about 10 or 15 minutes towards the end to take and answer any questions? Um, can I also ask everybody, if, if possible, to go on mute unless you're speaking, please? Just makes uh, hearing a lot easier. Uh, and if you do want to ask a question, can you please um, tell us who you are? Uh, introduce yourself and the company that you represent uh, before you ask the question just so we can keep track. Uh, that would be very, uh, very helpful. So, if we carry on with the presentation, uh, uh, the aim of the discussion forum today uh, is up on the screen now, um, primarily uh, to help you understand uh, Electrolink's CSS Connect product or service that we'll be introducing uh, as a CSS adapter, uh, its key functions and capabilities. Um, but also agree how um, the CSS will operate through our adapter in the context in the context of the broader change of supply process that uh, is currently in operation and will continue to be uh, in operation. Um, hopefully at the end of today you will be able to understand uh, the CSS Connect product both from a, uh, an electricity supplier perspective and also a gas shipper perspective because obviously this needs to be a dual fuel service. Uh, we'll outline uh, an approach to security and key management. Alan will take us through that and the support functions that wrap around that. Uh, and then I'll, I'll wrap up with um, sort of high level timescales uh, and the cost model for, uh, for providing this service. One of the main aims today is to seek your view A on whether this is something that's of interest to you, but also whether we've missed any uh, requirements that you would like us to include. And uh, by all means, feel free to bring those up at the end of the presentation or uh, subsequently uh, by email if you so wish. So moving on to the next slide, the context and framework of the service. What we're trying to do with this uh, adapter service is to reduce the connected parties workload um, to allow you to successfully participate in the new uh, faster switching um, work um, but with uh, the timescales according to your own delivery roadmaps rather than necessarily having to meet the timescales that the CSS is imposing. 
um, and we'll explain a little bit about how, how we intend to do that. Uh, we will be providing this service as a fully managed, secure and easy to implement service. Uh, we'll be providing it on the data transfer service. And I'll come on the next slide to talk about some options, but basically we will be providing a combination of legacy data flows. So uh, some of the data flows that you'll be aware will be retired from the data transfer catalog. Um, things like the registration D55 flow, we will continue to process that flow um, and uh, we will obviously um, take in the new CSS messages as well and provide translation services uh, between the two. We will continue to provide all the benefits that you rely on the DTS for around validation, uh, data transformation uh, and also to allow um, all the audit trails and uh, retransmissions and retries and error handling and all the things that you normally associate uh, with the data transfer around the CSS messaging. We want to work with you as a key partner to help not just uh, provide you with the service but help with your internal IT integration and with the testing that's being required through the DCC structured testing approach. Um, around pit sit and, and so on. I'm sure you're all aware of those uh, either through the smart metering program or through the um, faster switching program as well. Um, and then finally, um, the obvious question, how much will this cost? So we will be um, investing in this as part of the data transfer services agreement. So we will contract through the DTSA. It will just be another service on the data transfer service and it will be charged for using the existing charging mechanism. Uh, in other words, we won't be charging for this separately. It will be covered through existing supplier charges and um, uh, data traffic charges. So we will recover the investment over a standard regulatory period of five years. It just so happens that our regulatory period starts again uh, in 2020. So we'll, we'll cover a little bit more about that uh, later on uh, in the presentation. If we come on to the next slide to look at the key functions and capabilities, uh, what we've defined is three scenarios. Um, the first two scenarios effectively use existing data flow structures and formats. So uh, what we're calling translation service one, um, you as a market participant will continue to operate in the market with uh, as minimal change as possible. So you will continue to send your registration flows as you do now in DTC format. You'll continue to use uh, D55 to set up new registrations uh, and they will be sent um, across the DTS for electricity. We will intercept those data flows and we will translate those data flows into the relevant uh, CSS messages, the JSON format messages. And then similarly where there's a message coming back from the CSSP, the central service provider, uh, we will reconvert that from the JSON message into an existing um, DTC data flow. So to all intents and purposes, you will continue to operate your business using the legacy design for the switching program. Uh, now, you know, we're not naive enough to realize that that will mean no change whatsoever. What we're trying to do there is minimize uh, the amount of change. Translation service two is taking that one stage further and it's basically creating a series of legacy flow formats um, that mirror one for one the JSON messages that the CSSP will be sending and receiving. So we have a, a, a product that again is part of the data transfer service called Flow Builder that allows us to generate and create new flows and in fact allows you to generate and create new flow structures. Um, and, and what we will do is a one to one mapping between all the JSON messages and the dflow messages. So this is for market participants who um, want to go part way to develop their new systems but don't want the overhead of creating the messages in a format that's anything other than their current systems can already uh, understand, uh, generate, parse uh, and so on. The third service is then actually allowing uh, facilitating uh, those users who want to generate the JSON messages but are worried about um, network service levels, operational level agreements and so on. So you as a user of, of the adapter in this instance would generate the relevant JSON messages, uh, present them to our adapter service, and then we would take care of the security layer, the delivery layer, the service levels associated with getting that message in and out in real time to um, the CSSP. 
we had a question on the first uh, session as to how would those messages get to the adapter. Um, and we think that there's probably going to be two options for that. The first is you could use the existing interfaces using FTP or FTPS or SFTP, um, but some users might prefer to use a service architecture, and we will certainly be developing both of those options if there is a requirement identified or confirmed uh, through this process that we're going through now. The intent is to provide both. Um, and we hope that we will also be able to address one of the um, limitations that the CSSP seems to be putting out there of only being able to deliver to an individual customer through one single service connection or, or one webhook as they're, they're using that particular technology. Um, our service will uh, continue to route messages based on uh, the sort of routing algorithms that we've got in place. So for those, those of you who want CSSP messages to be delivered to different parts of your estate, um, then we will be able to do that through the adapter as well. All of those options will continue to use all the standard features where possible that are built into the data transfer service. So things like the audit trail, the live audit trail, we will be um, interspersing uh, the CSS messages with the existing audit trail and you will be able to search using the existing audit engine uh, and see results in, in the normal way. Uh, similarly, all the backup, all the recollect, all the resend uh, and all the security services that you're currently using through the DTS uh, will be made available. They may be refined to align with the specific requirements of the CSS, but you know, that, that is the benefit of using a translator that you can forget about all the uh, network connectivity elements uh, and so on. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Alan Gregory. Uh, Alan, if you could briefly introduce yourself and then uh, carry on and let me know when you want me to change the slides, please. Will do. Thank you very much, Paul. Good morning, everyone. Uh, or indeed, good afternoon as it is now. Um, so I've recently joined uh, Electrolink as an enterprise architect, and I'll be taking you through uh, our high level and a little bit more detail uh, from the description that Paul's given so far today. So looking at the high level picture um, that you can see on the screen or is on slide five, um, the line of business estate on the left hand side uses the existing physical, remote and virtual connections as the, the, there are in place at the moment. And we take those uh, files in, in any of the formats that, that are presented to us use the existing DTN hub, the DTS, and all, as Paul said, use all of the services that we have built into that infrastructure at the moment in terms of validation and routing. We would um, store the messages, the flows, all the messages, sign them, uh, encrypt, to manage all the encryption and decryption. We would then route those flows or those messages out to the CSS platform over HTTPS, so allowing um, the secure communication of all of that information across that network divide. Uh, and then when those would, all, all of this traffic would adhere to the current uh, DTS SLAs that we have in place around security around bandwidth and around um, guaranteed message delivery. As Paul says, we will have already in place the, the ability to replay and resend and re-receive re messages, retransmit messages across the, the platform. So the uh, CSS Connect adapter will, will take those services and enhance them to be used with the with the messages that are uh, described by CSSP. So next slide, slide, um, probably we're moving on to slide seven now, Paul. So again, this is a, an, another view of that high level. The core services enable the supplier or shipper to largely operate as is. As Paul says, you know, we're not naive enough to think that it doesn't mean any changes to your estate. There will be um, probably changes around batch timings that, that will need to be considered. But the COS flows will be sent to the GTN as now with the additional gas flows, which we're still in discussions with uh, UK Link about where we intercept those gas flows or if it's possible to intercept those gas flows. And we would um, 
tie all of those flows, correlate all of those flows from both sets of systems together uh, to provide that translation and correlation service and produce the JSON messages that require to be sent off to the CSSP platform. In the other direction, we would uh, provide the endpoints, the webhook places for CSSP to connect back into for all of the suppliers and route and transmit those messages back into the line of business estate, doing any, unless, uh, any necessary um, correlations in terms of tracking where registration messages are. We would then pre present those back into uh, the line of business estate as we do now, given the appropriate acknowledgement. So if we move on to slide eight, which gives a bit more detail around uh, the process. Um, this is the, the connection from a supplier or a shipper to the CSSP. You'll see that we'll update the data trans, uh, transfer catalog to include either new JSON message formats or, or uh, any supplemental information that is required for uh, the flow catalog to make sure that we can track those message, messages accurately. We would provide validation against those messages. Again, we would sign them. We would manage all the correlation. We would manage internally within, within the platform the one fail all fail by correlating the messages and making sure that when or if, if one particular um, uh, registration request were to fail, then we would fail all of them. If there were objections, they would all be objected to, etc. We would also uh, look to provide that mapping through a set of services uh, that allows multiple uh, suppliers to be link linked to shippers, so that we would provide uh, that functionality. That might involve calling back or holding data within our estate uh, to make that mapping. We would correlate all the flows and we intend to transmit all of those flows using either a uh, cloud to cloud or a public internet uh, connection into CSSP. We would track all of those flows and all of those messages and that all parts of this journey for all of those messages and flows will be available to view in real time through the existing audit view tools that you have access to as now. So if we move on to uh, slide nine, Paul, this is just a recap of all of those, uh, all of those functionality points. So as I said, supplier systems will remain largely unchanged. Uh, the usual flow files will be transmitted. Inbound flows will be validated as per the existing rules, and you'll understand that we have a very comprehensive set of set of rules that run to standard validation and extended validation. All of those existing capabilities will be made available as part of the CSS platform. We'll store all those flows and correlate them so we have a complete picture of the entire process end to end. Format those messages into into the Abacus defined JSON structures and then enriched with any other information that, that we hold as, as uh, part of our EMDH uh, provision and then send those messages off to the CSSP. We will manage all of the delivery statuses of those so if we are unable to present a message into CSSP we will hold that until we are able to present those those messages and, and get full acknowledgement back. We would adhere to the current principles that we won't acknowledge a message has been sent until we're sure the recipient has had it. So that provides the acknowledgement with the, with the comfort that the message has been delivered to the other end. So we will of course be signing those messages uh, as appropriate uh, and as defined by the CSS, CSS uh, Coder Connection. Okay, so if we move on to slide 10, Paul, um, th this is handling the inbound messages from the CSSP. So as I said, the platform would provide those uh, endpoints per market participant role and then validate those messages 
in the JSON format, make sure that the certificates that are associated with that message, that signed message, are still uh, current and they're not on any revocation list. Then we would unwrap that message, turn that message and correlate that message into in, in with the other messages that we hold, ensuring that if we've got a registration ID for a particular message, that's one thing that we we all we've already presented, and we can map that back to the original uh, original request. We store those messages, locate any other correlated messages that are required, generate flows, and that might be that we need to generate more than one flow, potentially to more than one mo uh, market participant. So all of that flow information will then be distributed using the existing. DTN services. Um, we would store any flows that we created into the flow store, create those flows and deliver those to the intended recipients. Again, all of those messages will be available through the existing audit tools and any messages and any translation and updates to the DTC would be made uh, to ensure the validity of those messages in both directions. So if we move on to uh, slide 11. Okay, and this is just a recap of, of those particular points. Those webhook endpoints registered will be registered within our uh, implementation. So that reduces the need for um, endpoints to be surfaced from, from supplier or shipper estates. Uh, on the public internet or through a dedicated connection, we would manage all that uh, that aspect for you. Inbound messages will be validated as I've described, making all necessary changes to the data transfer catalog to enable that uh, validation to occur. We will return and manage all of the messaging between CSSP and the supplier. So if at any point there's a failure in that in that process, we can resubmit, we can resend, we manage that internally within the, the CSS Connect platform. Uh, messages, again, will be translate, translated into the required flows, ensuring that their validity is also proven and then deliver those to the existing, uh, through the existing DTS mechanism. Logging everything along the way, and again, as we said, it's, uh, it's important that you guys have access to an audit log to understand exactly where those messages are. As you'll know, if you're familiar with the audit tools, you can look at failures and, uh, and throughput on uh, a number of different criteria. So, so we'll use that existing provision. So if we move on to slide uh, 13, there is, there is Kind of a setup process really that is required to to consider for for key management and there are the keys that we need to use to sign the messages uh, over to um, that we send over to the cssp we need to ensure the messages that come back from cssp are valid and assigned with their keys and match the keys that we that we would expect and that involves um, us registering the keys on behalf of uh, shippers and suppliers within the platform so that we can generate the messages. If you're generating your own messages, uh, it could be that you sign those messages at the point in your line of business systems. If not, then we will do that signing all for you. All of the role creation, role mapping that happens when you utilize the DTS as now will continue to work and we will add additional roles and responsibilities uh, that are required for this particular um, product within that platform. So you can manage those things yourselves. Keys are created um, within our platform. We would manage those in an appropriate key store that would um, conform to all of the requirements that are laid out in the, the code of connection documents and other security documents that are floating around the, the industry parties at the moment for approval. 
We will recycle and manage all of the keys in line with the key recycling policies. If those policy, if those keys are, are due to expire, we would ensure that the market participants to which those keys relate will be notified in good time. And we would make sure that we are checking all revocation lists uh, along the certification path to ensure the continued validity of those of those certificates in line with the code of connection documents. So that's broadly the um, the process end to end. I'd like to pause for a few uh, reflections on that. If uh, anyone has any comments or any questions, it would be uh, it would be good to take some of those now. Hi, um, it's Susan Turner here from Opus Energy. Um, we've, I've got a few questions actually. Um, the first one is basically, um, when are you going to be offering a detailed specification of what you're going to be putting on offer? So, um, sort of detailed schematics of how it's all going to work. So uh, so oh, sorry, Paul, did you want to answer that? Uh, I'm happy for you to go ahead. So we're currently working through a high level design. Um, overall, Paul is going to share a kind of timeline for some of the work that we've got involved on, on the next slide. I've paused just to, to get a, um, a feeling on whether or not the, the, the functionality that you see is, uh, is there. And I completely understand, Susan, that, that it's very difficult to, to tell that with such a high level picture. Um, but we will be working through the timescales. Paul, have you got anything to add on that? Yeah, I think our aim is to get get the sort of um, high level designs finished by the end of September, um, and that should include, you know, hopefully, the level of detail that you will need uh, to make a full assessment of, of the, the likely investment. We are, to some degree, at the beg and mercy of the DCC, uh, and I'm sure as uh, those of you who are close to the program. Uh, no, there's another iteration now of the interface design specifications, uh, and I think Ofgem have very recently uh, released a reschedule of what they're calling the near time planning or the near term planning, uh, which has shown a significant slippage for the agreement of those, uh, which is, is f uh, as a result of feedback from the industry basically saying there hasn't been time to review these properly. So I think that's a, a very good move. But what that will mean is that there will undoubtedly be a consequential slippage to the rest of the program. Uh, and Ofgem have taken an action to look at what that uh, sort of uh, left to right replan would look like. Brilliant. Thank you very for that. Um, we'll look forward to hearing about, you know, dates when they are announced. Um, and then the second one is that obviously um, when we look at mapping the old flows to the new flows, there's not a one-to-one -one scenario. Um, you know, we have like new flows that aren't going to be existing. Um, how are you going to manage things like, um, say, for annulments or things that didn't exist previously? So there's no existing data flow for that to go in on. How are you going to manage that or how have you thought about doing that? Yeah, so there's a number of solutions to that, um, Susan, and, and it, it's not just flows, it's data items as well. So if you go all the way down to the really granular uh, content of messages, um, if you look at the first flow, which is the D55, that has um, a number of data items that do translate across one for one into the registration JSON message. It has a number of data items in there that don't translate across and will never translate into anything that goes into the CSSP. And it has a number of data items that the JSON message expects that aren't included in that flow. So that's probably a good example to start with. Uh, what our adapter service will do is it will it will obviously use the one-for-one -one mapping where that exists. Where there are new data items that aren't in that flow, given that we have access to all the other industry flows around change of supply and registration, and we have a data store going back uh, six years, um, our expectation is that we will be able to extract that data from elsewhere within the DTS and populate on your behalf. Where it is a a new data item that's only used as part of the CSSP interface, so things like correlation IDs and so on, then we will generate, create, and manage those on your behalf. Uh, where there's data item in that D55 flow that um, some suppliers might use to make subsequent changes to MPAS, and they do that on the registration request, so things like saying, you know, this is my um, um, 
data collector, this is my data aggregator and so on, we will strip those out of the D55 and we will create a corresponding D205 and we will orchestrate that into MPAS at such a time as we know that the switch has been successful or um, dig it, you know, not send it if there's an objection or, or a withdrawal or annulment and so on. So that's just, just one example. We are working through that sort of mapping um, as, as we speak, so we don't have answers to all of those, but I, I haven't seen anything in that mapping exercise that says there is a critical piece of information that's necessary that we won't have access to. Now, if something does um, come up uh, along that, uh, that, you know, and if there's a data item that we just physically don't have access to, then it may mean that we need to tweak those existing flows or we need to generate another supplementary flow. Uh, and again, we can do that using our uh, flow builder tool. So I think Alan mentioned uh, some changes to the data transfer catalog during his presentation. Uh, the way that we would enact that is not through the formal data transfer catalog. That will continue to be managed by um, Morasco for the time being and uh, RECCO going forward once that procurement has been uh, concluded. But we have a product called um, Flow Builder which already has all of the DTC flows in it. So we can replicate those and continue to use those and the metadata associated with them on the DTS. And we can use that tool to generate new message structures uh, or amended message structures so that there are a number of solutions. And it may be that different suppliers want, you know, a different solution. So basically what you're saying is that um, you'll adapt where you can or match where you can. Um, pull from sort of archive data where you need to, and if it's not existing already, then you may just tweak the flows that um, that you're sending back and forth from suppliers. Is that right? Yes. And then, what about things that are completely new? That will you basically just create a new flow, so like a D55A for, or, or not a D55, but just say it's 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 something like status updates or things that perhaps we don't have a flow for now at all. Um, what you know would you basically just create a new flow for that yeah and, and that's what the flow builder product allows us to do we can we can uh, create define document publish and make live on the service a new flow within 24 hours and it's it's a very simple interface um, okay and then how will that be managed exactly and um, i know i'm a lot asking a lot of questions i'm sorry but um um in a sense like obviously we get the dtc update every three months so that we know what's changed in the flows will you be doing a similar sort of update sort of um program so that anything that changes in the sort of the industry as a whole will then be filtered into your systems you'll then make the modifications to your dtc if you like and then that will then flow through to us is that how that's envisioned working or is that still to be decided uh, no it's not till uh, not still to be decided. There are actually, again, a number of options, and, and that's really down to an individual user as to how they want to do that. So the Flow Builder product already exists. It's already live. It's already operational. Uh, what it allows you to do is create uh, new flows that are industry-wide and shared with everybody in the industry. Uh, so if there is a, con uh, a, a combined view that what we actually need is a D55A, as you've recommended or suggested there, uh, we can generate that. We can, we can wrap a change control process around that and that can go into a formal cycle like the DTC although I have to say much more efficiently than the DTC um, whether that's you know an iterative um, monthly or three monthly or six monthly cycle uh, we can facilitate that through that process but similarly if there is a group of users who want to design a new flow to supplement the information in a way that's different the Flow Builder products allows you to do that. So you could generate a D55B and only share that with a subset of users. And then finally, if there's an individual supplier or shipper who wants to generate a message that's of no value or no relevance or they just don't want to share it from an IPR perspective with the rest of the industry or other market participants, Flow Builder also allows them to do that, keep that design uh, private effectively between Electrolink and that party. That's great. Um, I have other questions, but I'll let somebody else talk now. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Paul. Uh, it's Mark Hackney, British Gas. Mark, oh, hello. Hi. Um, yeah, a couple of things, partly picking up on what's just been said. Um, obviously, the one thing that springs to mind that's missing from the 55, and I'm not sure that you could source, would be whether we're doing a domestic or business registration. Um, presumably, would we be looking to change 
something in the 55 that would allow us to do that? So we think that we can derive that from um, other data that we have access to, Mark, um, particularly around the profile class and so on. Yeah, um, not sure about that. Um, because, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to guarantee on that one, Paul, I think is the answer to that. Um, I think yeah, no, I'm, I, I'm aware that there are different interpretations between different suppliers about uh, the sort of yeah. boundary between domestic and, and SME uh, sits and so on. So, uh, as yeah. I say, that's our current thinking. Um, again, there's no reason why that couldn't be provided by an individual supplier, either on a separate flow or on an amendment to one of the existing flows. Um, yeah. If I, I don't know if that data is held in echoes at all. Because um, one of the uh, one of the other challenges that we've got is how to manage related empans where you have a child parent relationship. Uh, I think the rules in in the new switching arrangements are that if you switch the child, you automatically inherit inherit the uh, sorry if you switch the parent, you automatically inherit the child. Um, and and it may be that we need access to echoes to um, manage that sort of parent child relationship. So I don't know if that particular domestic or business registration identifier is already held in uh, in echoes. Well, it's what you deem it to be when you do the registration. So if if it's a change of status as a part of the switch then that's how you change the status. Um, so I don't think so. A um, couple of other things. In terms of, you say, we use the existing flows, obviously the one we're clicking around is 55. As they will no longer be part of the industry catalogue, yep. because they will have been deleted, does that then mean they will become the D2055 or something, rather than the 55? Because I was under the impression that the number ranges are allocated depending on what they are. Yeah, so the point that Mark's relating to here is we already provide non-DTC flows for uh, some of our customers. Um, and what we have is an agreement with GEMSERF who manage the DTC um, that we can use any D flow numbers that are above 2,000. So you may see from time to time D2019s, uh, D2029s. Um, it, it's a, another question, Mark. We, I think we have some options uh, the two most obvious options are, yes, we could create a D3055, uh, but I'm aware that that would mean a change to your systems. Um, alternatively, we could um, do an internal mapping uh, and effectively allow you to continue using that, despite the fact it's been deleted from the DTC. I think that might be the easiest, uh, the easiest option. Or we could actually go through the consequential changes group um, and stop the removal of the D55 from the catalogue. I recognise that that has a whole other can of worms uh, to open up around uh, agreed procedures and so on, but that is another yeah. option. Yeah. Um, carrying on, I've got a couple more, uh, just quick ones. In terms of, obviously, we've sent the 55, presumably you would need to create a new flow to tell us that that's been accepted because we, otherwise there's nothing to tell us it's been accepted. So that's yes. a new, new DTC flow. Okay, that's fine. One other very quick one then. You mentioned the existing SLAs. Now, I know the DTN always does better than its SLA, but the SLA is, two, is still two hours. Is that going to be realistic when we are talking about needing to do these things a lot quicker than we do anything today? Uh, absolutely not. And, and one of the things that we'll be doing for the uh, adapter is to make sure that we have prioritization for the processing of those messages. Now, we, we've done some analysis uh, actually quite some time ago when we first did the lobbying around industry to reuse the existing network. And we believe that um, at least 96% of um, small messages, which these will be, um, will be um, would meet the requirements, the latency requirements that the DCC were pushing around at that time. Now, the DCC have significantly increased their latency requirements, and I think they have some uh, quite aggressive uh, delivery times specified in their uh, internal requirement specification, which you may not have seen. I don't know. Um, recent communication discussion, given that the CSSP is pushing an internet-only solution, um, we are working with the DCC to help them refine their latency requirements to make it more suitable for uh, internet-based traffic. So I suspect that that, you know, very small numbers of um, microseconds, I think they had 200 milliseconds in, uh, in their requirement spec, I suspect that that will significantly lengthen. Um, 
I don't believe Electrolink could provide a service that is only, you know, uses reasonable endeavours to, to meet small delivery times uh, and just hope that things get through. So we will be prioritising those messages through the application. That was a very long-winded answer, wasn't it? Sorry, Mark. No, no, no. It's, no, it's, it, it, it's a, a proper explanation and answer. Um, no, that's all for me for now. Thank you, Mark. Um, Paul, it's uh, John Hawkins, GemServe. Um, Hello, John. You're all right. Um, I, one question around the um, uh, setting of the D55, and I assume you're talking about the equivalent of a shipper confirmation file for gas. Yeah, so the CNF, yeah. Yeah. Um, so on that on, on that one there, how I've got two questions on that. How would that work for uh, initiating a, a one fair all fair or dual fuel switch? which I believe the CSS message has to be sent in a single switch request for that to work. Yep. Right. So, 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 so the, the point, if I can answer that one first, uh, the point that uh, Alan took us through around correlation is all about that type of issue. So uh, we would need to wait until we had uh, the uh, connection request or the registration request for both of those parties. Um, where one of those um, is missing, so for instance, you may have a non-dual fuel uh, supplier, uh, we'd need to find some way of interrogating or communicating with the second supplier on that issue. Again, that would use the same mechanisms that we've talked about, uh, either in terms of uh, JSON messages or in terms of flows. So you would essentially need something within those flows to say, uh, FYI, you should be expecting a partner flow for gas or electric, and you would then need to correlate those to create the JSON message. Yes, we wouldn't expect that to be necessarily flagged in the flow, because if we see a single um, uh, registration request, um, we would know to expect um, the dual fuel, and if it's a dual fuel site. But, uh... Okay, well. Paul, isn't that presuming that all switches will be dual fuel? Yeah, I thought that as soon as I said it. Um, it, it does. So whether there's, an, again, whether there's an indicator that the supplier would have, uh, I, I personally don't know um, whether that's the case. I would have to refer that to one of my business analysts. Sorry, Jonathan, I think you said you had two questions. Yeah, the other one was on the uh, ship confirmation flow, because that flow is still going to exist uh, in, uh, for UK Link um, for, for, for the other set up settlement purposes. Yeah. So would the shipper, would, would that be the shipper sending that on behalf of the supplier to keep it in today's model, or would the supplier be sending that flow structure straight into the DTN? The age-old question, shippers versus suppliers. Um, again, it's it's something that we haven't yet fully bottomed out, so there are a number of options. Um, and, and, and taking a step back, we, we haven't yet bottomed out how to intercept the gas side of, of the data. So there are a number of options that I think Alan said we're talking to XServe about at the moment uh, in terms of um, either the shipper – uh, can send us the data as well as sending it to Exaserve, and the conversations I've had uh, on a bilateral basis with uh, with a number of shippers suggests that's probably the easiest way from their perspective. So they continue to send the confirmation flows uh, directly to Exaserve, um, but they send a copy to us as well in order to connect to the CSSP. Um, we've also been talking for a longer time uh, with Exaserve on a more strategic link up between the two networks, uh, so that might be another option uh, as well. Um, Okay, right. So the uh, so, so so the shipper would either send it across both networks, um, and then uh, or there's the option of continuing to just send via IX and you intercepting that data by some kind of agreement. Yep. So there are two of the options. We have looked at other options. For instance, um, putting the DTS connection in between the shipper and Exaserve. Uh, and us taking care of forwarding the message on to Exaserve. We don't think that that's particularly palatable to um, shippers, uh, but again, it's another option that we can offer. Okay, and and I think the Exaserve consequential changes were working on the assumption that confirmation would come after they'd received a sync message from the CSS. So is that is, is that still the case, or is that something that they're just, if this were a the solution, they'd almost hold it until you it had come back around the loop 
I think, to be honest, that's a level of detail we don't have at the moment. So we talked about that sort of mapping process. Uh, we've got one of our BAs looking at that at the moment, and that's a level of detail that we need to address in the next few weeks. All right. All right, great. Cheers, Paul. Yeah. Sorry, Jonathan. Yeah. Anybody else have any more questions? I'm aware we've got uh, 15 minutes, so there's plenty of time. Hi, Paul. It's Andrew from Utility Team. Uh, Hello, Andrew. A couple of questions. The gas side, if we're sending, say, an FS42 to you, what would be the response back? Are you going to send CFR SO7s, or is it going to be a different type of flow? You're talking to the wrong person to answer that, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> do you know when you will be having sort of the in-depth? So, again, I'd refer to that mapping exercise that's currently underway. Uh, so we've got, uh, well, we've got um, John Wiggins, who some of you will know was the person responsible for putting the adjacent message structures together in um, uh, in the central system. Uh, he's done some part of that work and that's now being picked up by a, another business analyst um, as I speak. So uh, hopefully in the next uh, next days and weeks we'll be able to answer that. Okay, that's good. Uh, another question that I've been asked to ask, which is quite interesting, is the charging structure, structure for this. How will an existing supplier who uses a DTN be charged for this? So can I hold that question until we come to the next set of slides? There's yep. another two slides, and, and that's covered on one of the slides. No, that would be brilliant. That's all from me. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Anybody else? Yeah. Hi, Paul. Uh, this is Manish Surana from Haven Power. Hello, Manish. Uh, my question, basically, is uh, now we have an, an, an another layer, basically, where the messages would be stored, uh, basically, within the uh, Electrolink environment, right? And uh, what CS has offered, basically, via uh, DCC is another service management uh, tool, basically, for the uh, management of uh, error handling or whatever, right? Now, how this is going to work, basically, in this model, the overall service management? So, um my understanding of what the DCC are providing or the CSSP is providing around service management is uh, literally um, limited to uh, issues and calls and risks. What they're not doing is they're not doing any service management on the network itself, uh, which is why, uh, as I said, you know, we couldn't meet their technical requirements because our service is much richer than that. So if you choose to connect with their first option on the public internet, uh, it will be down to you as an individual user of their services to do that service management of the network itself, um, which obviously is quite difficult over an internet connection, given you may have multiple ISPs in the way. So there is still a big question mark in my mind about how the DCC will manage things like SLAs and OLAs uh, for a pure internet-based connection. And to be honest, the same argument goes towards the second option, which is their virtual private connection, because it's not again, not a, a sort of a, a network, not a full seven layer network model that they're looking to uh, to procure or provide from Exaserve. It is just bandwidth on a network link. So all the service management aspects will have to be provided by you as a user of that connection option, which is why I think the, the final option, which is the adapter service, which is one of the services that Electron will be offering, is, uh, is far superior because it means you don't have to worry about all those things like, you know, you know retries, resends, uh, error management, uh, alert management, uh, and all those good things. Yeah, and then I think in terms of the uh, the actual portal, what they are offering, will you be managing on a supplier's behalf, or will that be directly uh, accessible to uh, us as a supplier, basically, to manage that conversation? So if it's a portal for sort of ad hoc queries and so on, then we don't see that we can uh, that we would add any value. So we would expect that you would continue to use that. Right. Is that something that you would be wanting us to manage on your behalf? Uh, I think it's more about the uh, the communication, basically. Let's say if we send a message, a request message, right, and it then not come through basically end to end. Uh, is it something uh, we don't know where it is failed uh, in a way in the process? So how right. that's going to be managed end to end, basically, in terms yeah, of so that service management aspect. So sorry, Manish, I misunderstood then in that case. So so you would be sending your messages to our adapter, and we would manage that delivery to you. And you would get two levels of acknowledgement. The first would be uh, the equivalent or the same as our network level acknowledgement, which we excuse me, an absolute guarantee that your message has got to the recipient. 
and then there's effectively an application level acknowledgement that said yes and your registration has been uh, successfully received or no it hasn't and it's been rejected that will be a JSON message into us and we would convert that either well we'd either pass it through as a JSON message or we'd convert it into into a dflow if there's um, if, if the question was more around uh, what happens if there's an issue would you raise a help desk call with Electrolink or would you raise a help desk call with the DCC um, then I think the DCC are pushing for a model that says they uh, have a central service management um, help desk system and they will triage out to uh, third parties whether that third party be an existing service provider uh, whether it's an adapter provider and so on but Electrolink already does provide a technical help desk so you know if, if your first port of call if you think it's a network failure rather than uh, a CSSP problem then of course you're still uh, very welcome to call uh, Electrolink's help desk and we've got a program of work uh, behind all this to look at uh, how we would provide that on a more uh, 24 by 7 basis. We do already provide a technical help desk service um, via um, our service provider, um, but, but uh, we don't tend to have a lot of service calls, uh, so we may need to make that a little bit more um, uh, robust and, and resource rich. I don't know if that answers the question, Manish. Yeah, I think that, that's exactly, I think I was uh, looking basically. So what sounds like basically is our first of con first point of contact would be via the CSS Connect service and then it would be via the Electrolink service management so that we can start our conversation and then it needs to be trashed via, um, I mean, uh, let's say the support desk basically for uh, CSS itself would be a uh, second stage looks to me. Yeah and, and I think uh, there is a whole program of work that we're involved in that the DCC is running uh, in conjunction I think it's with Capgemini to look at how all that uh, service management uh, piece will into work so they're looking at whether there's any um, uh, technical binding between technical systems around the help desk so we run our own help desk system I think the DCC uh, are um, standardizing on uh, service now um, so whether we need to integrate those from a technical perspective uh, or whether um, it will be a, you know handing over a call via help desks uh, hasn't yet been decided but, but I think that question is broader than just Electrolink's adapters I think it's a question that the program needs to answer really uh, and, and we will fit in to meet the requirements of the program Did you? sorry I misunderstood your question originally Manish hopefully we got there so we have five minutes. Can I suggest, uh, I know Susan you've got uh, additional questions, can I just suggest we quickly run through the last slide because um, this is looking at uh, time scales uh, and uh, particularly answers uh, to some degree the question that somebody asked around uh, charging and how our charging mechanism works. So the um, the slide that you see on the screen now has uh, three types of activity, uh, some uh, design, build and test activities, uh, which are in, uh, sorry, design and build activities which are in orange, some green activities which are around build and test, and then the blue activities of the DCC's formal uh, testing program. As I say, I think that is highly likely to change, and it's likely that some of that will be pushed back uh, to the right hand side following off Jem's recent discussions around uh, replanning the activities. Um, but in, in the meantime, given that the majority of what we're doing is based on existing product, it's based on existing legal agreements, and it's based on existing connectivity. Um, the complexity is around the translation and the orchestration rather than building something from scratch. So it's about changing a solution that we already have and then wrapping the uh, prioritization mechanism uh, around that. So we're confident that we will uh, meet the timescales that the DCC have indicated. Um, to answer I think it was Susan's questions around the high level designs and low level designs we're targeting end of September middle of October to have those available so hopefully that will uh, meet your requirements um, we are also however keen to seek your views to make sure that we've covered all the requirements and if there are any other requirements that we haven't yet identified and that don't come out in that design phase then please come and talk to us as soon as possible this will be an industry solution provided by an industry central body on behalf of the industry for the industry's use so it needs to be you setting um, to some degree that the requirements of what it is that we're delivering
In terms of the provision of the services, this will be one of our uh, cost recovery services that will be delivered under the existing data transfer services agreement. So again, there will be no need to negotiate uh, complicated uh, agreements. There won't be no need to procure new services. Um, we do that on your behalf. Uh, the cost of the services will be recovered through our existing DTSA charging principles. Um, and the development costs will be reconciled over our next regulatory period, which is uh, 2020 to 2025. In terms of what that means on a you know pounds and pennies um, basis, we can't say at the moment because that will depend uh, very much on what the final set of requirements uh, will be. Um, but we would expect to recover those charges through um, either a combination of traffic charges and supplier charges or just traffic charges or just supply charges, but that will be determined by our governance board, which is the DTS user group. Uh, and we'll be going to them uh, in, uh, I think it's two weeks tomorrow, um, to present these plans. So in terms of um, an order of magnitude, if people are interested, uh, and I guess you all are, uh, we would expect that for a supplier, your annual cost is going to be around about um, 20% of what you currently pay for the DTS. Now, I, I say that with no prejudice and with lots of caveats around this, but I would also put that in the context of we have um, just re-procured the data transfer service and um, part of that re-procurement has resulted in some of our other costs going down. So we have an activity which is written into our agreement. Again, this is part of the regulated service uh, and, and a time scale associated when, with when we publish uh, pricing. Uh, that time scale says that by the end of September this year, we need to give all our DTS users uh, an indicative price for next year. Uh, and where possible, we will give an indication of what that means for future years as well. So by the end of September, we will be able to say for all of our cost recovery services, including the DTS and including the CSS adapter, uh, we expect your pricing will be this for supply charges and this for volume charges from the 1st of January 2020. Subsequent to issuing the indicative charges, uh, we then issue a budget paper for all DTS contract managers to review and provide comment on. Uh, that typically comes out between 30 and 60 working days at the end of the year. So I think that works out around uh, early October to middle of November. And the only reason I'm being KG is because we need to make sure that that also goes through our internal governance, through our board of directors, and I'm just not sure of when those meetings uh, are scheduled. Um, once the budget paper is issued, we then uh, hold a meeting to discuss any comments that have come back, and then formally we issue towards the end of the year what the final pricing for next year is going to be. Um, so that hopefully that gives you enough information to at least make some assessment of whether this is a cost-effective solution for you. I would reiterate this is being done on a cost recovery basis only, so we don't make a profit from the DTS. So um, I'm aware it's one o'clock. Um, does anybody have any final urgent questions they would like to ask? If not, I'd like to just uh, take two minutes to talk about next steps. I'm hearing silence. So if you do have any other questions, please feel free uh, to send them either to the Electrolink help desk, which is helpdesk at electrolink.co.uk, uh, or reply to the meeting invitation, which will get them to Kyle, uh, or you're very welcome to, to come and talk to me, either on the phone or by email as well. What would be very helpful is to be able to go to the DTS user group on the 6th of September uh, with uh, as much support as we possibly can. Um, so I would ask any of you who are interested in continuing to look at this and thinking it may be an option for you, if you could give us an expression of interest, that would be very helpful and very valuable. Uh, we've had uh, quite a raft of those already from the first session that we ran uh, on Tuesday. It's not a commitment in any way. It just helps us um, gauge the level of interest so that we can make sure that we're uh, providing a service that's going to be cost effective for the entire industry. So hopefully you found that useful, found that helpful. Please feedback any comments. Um, I think that's it. I think we wrap up and say thank you very much for, uh, for attending.